All right, guys. Uh, we'll try to make up a little bit of time here. So this is going to be an update on vasopressors. Um, by show of hands, who's familiar with the rock band Queen? If you are not, you will not get any of these jokes, but I'm almost jealous of all the awesome music that you're going to discover if you look up half these songs. Perhaps the best band ever. Um, they're way up there. So this is kind of a tribute to them with the review of vasopressors. A lot happier topic than my last one, and I'm still sorry about that. <laughs> so we're going to talk about some vasopressors, and I'm going to focus on what you guys see, all right? So you got to know some pressors. You need to know some things on push dose. Yes? Is it just not working? So it is. Better? Don't notice much change, but oh, there we go. All right. So. We're going to talk about the pressures you got to know. We're going to talk about push dose pressers, which are awesome. And we're going to talk about peripheral pressers, which are awesome-er. So, under pressure. So, we're going to start with the champion, and we're going to review some of the complications with some of the others. So, with any pressure talk, we really need to talk a lot about biochemistry, and you really need to know what each of these R chains are in this. No, I'm just kidding. We're not going to talk about any of that crap because nobody cares, all right? Nobody cares. I don't care. There's no reason that you care at all. So, this is for clinicians, not for chemists. Ignore all the alpha, beta, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to tell you the traps for some of these, and that's what I want you to know. So, scenario one. This is just good old-fashioned hypotension from sepsis, okay? There's no tricks. They just got low blood pressure. They're sick. You want to fix it. Okay, what are you going to do once your IV fluids aren't working well enough? You're going to give norepi. This is the champion. Okay, if you only know one vasopressor, this is your vasopressor. Okay, if this is it, that's cool. There's a surprisingly few number of patients that you will hurt if this is the only vasopressor you ever reach for ever. Okay, some call it levofed because he's sold out to big pharma. That's cool. Not, not this lecture. Okay, so norepi, I want you to remember nickel. Okay, and here's why I want you to remember nickel. That's your starting dose. There truthfully isn't great data on what the max dose is. This is what you start with, okay? 0.05 mics per kg per minute. If your shop is not using mics per kg per minute, a little bit of a patient safety thing because different size patients need different size doses of this, all right? Make sure that you double check the units that you're using because some people are still using an hourly based dose or they're not doing weight based doses. So make sure you pay attention to that. The nickel thing only works if it's mics per kg per minute. Since a lot of patients are roughly 100 kilos, sometimes you'll actually see um, it report in different ways, but check your units, because that could be a huge dosing error. Scenario two, you got a PEA arrest, right? Got some CPR going. Pre-hospital folks do what they do. They come in, now what? So, another one bites the dust is epinephrine, okay? This is your code drug, okay? This is what we're reaching for. Now, classically, the ACLS doses for this are awfully crude, okay? So who took ACLS recently? The, the recent course, right. So I think a milligram is just too blunt, okay? Some people need more than that, some need less. So if you're gonna do a real code, I think an arterial line is mandatory, all right? This is emerging stuff. I get it if your shop can't do it, but I really think that if you're actually doing a code and not just doing a couple rounds and calling it, an arterial line will help guide your resuscitation. Some folks actually need more than a milligram, some need a lot less, okay? And also if you're picking up pseudo-PEA where they're not truly arrested, there's actually a good squeeze. You actually learn some of those ultrasound, ultrasound skills that you picked up yesterday and you look at the heart, you just have a really poor EF. Those folks probably don't need a milligram. Okay, they just have a really low blood pressure, in which case I'll often give 0.1 milligrams IV or something like that. If you have a pulse, you should never get a milligram of epi. Okay, however, there's surprisingly little data on using this for sepsis. Okay, some other countries actually use epinephrine routinely. Um, I think of it as God's presser. Okay, because this is what your adrenal glands actually produce. Okay, so it's actually not a terrible option. It's just going to jack up your heart rate. So if you ever have bradycardia and low blood pressure and there's not coronary artery disease, this is a reasonable choice. Scenario three, got some pneumonia. You want to intubate the guy. The current blood pressure is a little soft, right? So how often do you think about the blood pressure when you're about to intubate? Everyone focuses on the O2 sat, but the thing that's going to really kill your patient is not necessarily hypoxia if you do it right. It's the hypotension associated with this. There's a lot of stuff that's changing, and that transient hypotension is brutal. So what are you going to do about it? So. I don't want you to delay your pressors. I want you to go ahead and get them started. So I'm gonna to talk to you about making push dose epi, okay? This is really simple. You start by getting a milligram of epinephrine, okay? And this is the crash cart epi, 
all right? So the concentrated stuff. What you're gonna do is you're gonna pull up a normal saline flush and you're gonna squirt one ml of that normal saline at your favorite nurse, okay? Make sure they know that you're doing this in advance. Once you've wasted that, you now have a syringe that's got one free ml and nine, ML, nine mls of normal saline. Now all you have to do is fill back up your syringe up to 10, okay? Now much like a good cocktail, you have to shake this, okay? So afterwards, get a little bit of air in that syringe and shake it up. Otherwise, you've got 0.1 milligrams of epi sitting at the end of your syringe. If you don't shake it up and then you give an ml, you gave all the epi and then you're left with your normal saline flush. So make sure that you shake it to, to make sure that it's there. And then this is actually critically important and commonly forgotten in these situations, you gotta label it, okay? If you got one of these slick stickers, that's awesome. Otherwise, a Sharpie and a Band-Aid looks really, really ghetto, but actually works pretty well, okay? And this does not get laid down anywhere. I cannot emphasize that enough because this looks just like normal saline, okay? It's clear, there's nothing else there. If you don't label it, you get in trouble. And the only place this goes is in your pocket. Okay? If you're not actively squirting it into your patient, it goes in your pocket to avoid dosing errors. So what do you do with this now one to 100,000 epi that you've got in your pocket? Okay? You actually can give one or two mLs of this through a peripheral IV just fine. And how do I know this is safe? This is exactly the same concentration of lidocaine with epi. Okay? So if you're comfortable injecting five mLs of lidocaine with epi to fix a wound, you're comfortable that if this peripheral IV blows up and you end up squirting a couple mLs into the soft tissue, their arm's not gonna fall off, okay? Epinephrine's surprisingly safe. The extravasation risks are not that high for this procedure, okay? And you can give up to two mLs every two minutes. Is the max dose. I often give a lot less. You can titrate this, give them a little squirt before you intubate, it helps you out. Also great while you're doing another procedure. So you wanna throw in that central line, their blood pressure's already kinda of crummy, that's why you're doing it. Great to give a dose of this while you resuscitate. Scenario four. Some more septic shock, but wait a minute, this guy's got CHF. And then you got a little bit better with the norepi drip. And then you see this EF of 10% while they're rocking that norepi drip. What are you gonna do? Well, that's tough. So dobutamine is represented by Bohem Bohemian Rhapsody. And why does that awesome song represent this weird drug? Well, because of this line. A little high, a little low, any way the wind blows, doesn't really matter to me, to me. I can't sing, I'm not going to. So if you're waiting on that, it just isn't gonna happen. The reason is, is this gets lumped in with the vasopressors, and it's not, it's a dirty lie, because about a third of the people that get this drug drop their blood pressure, right? So it's not much of a vasopressor, it's more of like a random number generator, okay? <laughs> you're gonna have a third of your patients get a higher blood pressure, a third will drop their blood pressure, and a third will stay the same. Now, this does increase the squeeze of the heart, however, it may have some vasodilatory effects out in the periphery, so you really don't know what's gonna happen. The main thing is, if you're using this drug, you need to be on the phone with somebody else. Um, I am passionate about vasopressors, which is a really weird thing to say. I don't use this drug without having a phone call with either an intensivist or most commonly a cardiologist, because it's a really tricky drug, almost never used as monotherapy, and that's the main thing I want you to take home from this, okay? Use it with other drugs, almost never by itself, and always call a buddy, because it's not something that's really a standard EM drug, in my humble opinion. We can safely use it, it's just not your bread and butter. We don't reach for it often, even at our tertiary care center. So now you're working in the ICU, you see this worsening septic shock. The MICU fellow suggests adding some phenylephrine to it, right? And you're thinking, hey, let's squeeze the periphery, right? That's what we need to do. What are the risks to this drug? So this is represented by Don't Stop Me Now. Phenylephrine is one of the more dangerous vasopressors that you actually commonly see and use, and here's why. This is a pure peripheral squeeze, okay? And you'll, you'll also hear it called neosinephrine. It makes a lot of sense that this is what we want to do accomplish. We don't want to flog the heart. We don't want to do anything else, okay? We just want to squeeze the blood vessels. And that's what you probably thought of as a vasopressor. And you're right. The problem is, is it puts more strain on that heart. So if there is any problem with that heart, and I'm not going to get into the details, but just think heart badness, it's going to make it worse because that heart is now working against more squeeze. It may also cause bradycardia as well. So I don't really like this drug. A lot of the times that people reach for this, I would rather reach for epi. There is a narrow room for it, but just be aware that it's really tricky and you better be a rock star with the echocardiography um, if you're gonna be doing this by yourself because if you're missing things like valvular disease or things like that, this drug can kill someone. It can be a clean kill. 
and you won't know what's going on because usually when you reach for it, things aren't going so hot or else you wouldn't be giving the patient phenylephrine. They'll just get sicker and sicker and you won't realize that you're actually causing florid cardiopulmonary, cardiopulmonary shock um, because of the extra strain you put on the heart. So how about this? You got a four-year-old, right? You got sepsis of some reason that doesn't matter for this vignette because it's not a trick question. You call the PICU and then the, the dirty word of dopamine comes up, right? Because that's what you give the kids, right? Because they're not tiny adults, so they get their own vasopressor. So is dopamine better in kids? Not at all. So this is Killer Queen. Dopamine is a garbage drug. It is absolutely awful. Um, I think that its main use is to generate um, lawsuits. Um, it's really terrible, okay? That's its only indication to me. If you've got this in your Pyxis, this is the drug to throw away and put something awesome like ketamine in its place. Renal protection is a garbage myth that I don't have time to talk about. It causes more dysrhythmias. It's worse in every way. There was an RCT that showed that it tripled mortality. Do you know how hard it is to find RCTs that show that a drug tripled mortality? They had 21% mortality in dopamine, 7% in epi. And you might say, oh, that's a Brazilian PICU. This is the only study that's ever done this, all right? This is a terrible drug. This is not a slide I like having in my slide set, but every seven people that you gave in that study, dopamine, you killed somebody, all right? This is terrible. Stop using it. Kids are mostly small adults after they get past three months of age. Just move on. It's okay. You can give kids norepi. And none of the things that is touted is for why this is what we should use dopamine for actually hold up. All right, so now you're working again in the ED. You successfully didn't kill your last patient with dopamine, and you find someone with sepsis. You got that soft map again. Talk to the ICU. You're at a, a busy place. There's 30 people in the waiting room, and they prefer to do their own lines, okay? So your intensivist wants to do the central line. What are you going to do? Well, you got a couple of choices. One is you can just wait and just see if they get better, or you can do peripheral vasopressors, which is surprisingly safe, okay? This is why some people like dopamine, because of the myth that if it squirts out in the vessel, nothing bad will happen. Not true, but whatever. So here's what you want to do with the peripheral um, vasopressor. You want to have a good solid line. This is not a time for the 22 and the pinky. You want a real line, okay? If you guys learn how to do ultrasound guided lines, that's fine, but you want to make sure that this was a good single stick and not one where you tried seven times before you really got the, the, the uh, cannula in, okay? So preferably, the closer you get to the center, the better it is. So AC or proximal, I usually do this um, in some of those mid-humerus type lines, okay? That's my favorite for this, almost always ultrasound guided. 85% of the extravasation events in the biggest studies are actually going distal to the AC. So almost all the times that these things blew up and caused problems, they're off in the hand, etc. And use them as short of a time as possible. So you've got a plan of, you know, someone else is going to be thrown in a central line. This is probably not a great thing to do for two or three days, okay? And 96% of the events happen over four hours. So if you're doing it for just a few hours, it's probably fine. So if you're at a shop where they want to do the central lines upstairs, maybe they're really tight on their bundling and they really think the ER is dirty because it really is a dirty place uh, or something like that, it's okay. Or if you're uncomfortable doing central lines, that's okay for someone else to be doing this um, later. But as opposed to just letting your patient have a crappy blood pressure for four hours, go ahead and start peripheral vasopressors. So next scenario. Got a 55-year-old guy, he's getting worse, he's already on norepinephrine, the map of 50, and you just, you're flogging him with norepi, things just aren't going well. What should you do? Don't stop me now. This is what I call rush to CVS, okay? So the rush exam is an ultrasound set that's a lot like a medical fast exam, okay? I, I just encourage you to Google it. I don't have enough time to talk about it right now, but R-U-S-H. It's basically a fast exam with some extra bells and whistles, and it is a medical evaluation of hypotension that you can do with relatively commonly done scans. If you know how to do a fast exam and a basic echo, you're two thirds of the way there, okay? So you're gonna bust out the ultrasound machine to make sure there's not something mechanical going on. There's no pericardial nonsense. There's no lung that got dropped. There's no AAA disaster, okay? You're ruling those things out with the ultrasound, okay? Next, you're gonna give the calcium bolus, okay? Calcium makes hearts happy. Don't really know why, don't have time to tell you. So calcium is a great thing to add when things aren't working well, it actually increases contractility. Vasopressin is a great thing to add. By itself, I don't really like vasopressin as a monotherapy. It's awesome when you add it to other stuff. This is the oregano that you add to your pasta, not the sauce itself. And then consider steroids, okay? When you're actually pulling out more than one vasopressor, think, could this be something having to do with an adrenal crisis or something like that? in which case using steroid doses would actually make a lot of sense. I don't routinely do this, 
the literature is full of reasons why you shouldn't give steroids to all your hypotensive patients, but if things aren't going well, reach for the steroids. So rush to CVS. So rush exam, calcium, vasopressin, steroids. This is something that you should use when things aren't going well. If they respond well to norepi, I still think that every patient getting a vasopressor should get an echo of their heart, but that's just me. Do we have any questions? So, summary. Norepi, started at a nickel because it's an awesome drug. Should be your go-to. Remember how to do push-dose epi. If you're uncomfortable with it, have someone that's done it before show you because this is not the time to experiment. Also have caution with dobutamine and phenylephrine because those are dangerous drugs. Completely abandon dopamine. If anyone suggests it, tell them no and don't do it. And then remember, rush to CVS. Thank you all very much. Thank you.